and to go travel a distance and serve Elizabeth. We also like to think maybe the fact that she was able to accept the burden and the joy and the blessing, or the burdens that come, because whenever God gives a blessing, there has to be some kind of burden. Right? So she went through a lot of tribulations. And the fact that she accepted them in humility and quietness also attests to her humility. And we can think on and on of many, many things that we can say defines or exemplifies St. Mary's humility. But what I'd like to share, in my opinion, which shows the greatest fruit of her humility is in something that she said. So when the angel appeared to her and then the Holy Spirit was upon her, she conceived, immediately she prophesied because the Holy Spirit was upon her. So the words, her praise in the, chapter, in the book of Luke, it's not just her own words, it's a prophecy. The Spirit of God has prophesied through her. So she said, my soul magnifies the Lord my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Where do we think is the epitome or the fruit of a life of humility in this, in this phrase? Often people may say, okay, it's what she said, regarded by the Holy State. True. But there's something more powerful. And it may not be visible to the eye at first. It is actually the next line. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for you as mighty has done great things for me. This is the line or the phrase that shows she, she is a very humble person. Because when we see, when we take the journey to become humble, and it is a journey. There are different levels and different stages in growth. And this shows, and I'll share with you how, I believe that this shows she had reached, she had reached a true level of humility. But before we do that, we need to ask, who is humble? Who is truly the humble person? And if we think about it, there's only one person who's really humble. Only one person who really lowered themselves, and it's our Lord Jesus Christ. Only. Because he, the creator of the entire universe, the creator of the, the creator of the entire universe, becomes man, takes the form of his creation, and then gets persecuted, gets spit on, gets beat, gets crucified, is betrayed, right? Washes the feet of the disciples, does so and so. This is the creator of the universe. The creator of the universe became man. There is nothing probably more humbling or no, more, no action that is more humble than what the Lord Christ did. So truly, truly, if we're talking about a person lowering themselves, our Lord Jesus Christ is truly the real humble person. Now let's talk about ourselves. How, how are we humble? Have we lowered ourselves to such a, such a state? Have we done anything of that sort? No, we didn't, we can't. So how do we relate humility to ourselves? Humility, if we want to define it in our own, in terms of our own humanity, humility is to know who you really are. Because we can't get any lower than where we are. Right? How did the Lord create us? He took some dust and said, let there be man. Right? So, if we remember, what the Lord said, dust you came and dust you shall return. From dust you came and dust you shall return. In fact, when I speak of humility, I'm not saying individual, or sorry, personal humility. I'm talking about humanity as a whole. We as humans must be humble. And to be humble is to acknowledge who we really are and not to think highly of ourselves. Because I'm going to take it from one angle. What? There is a difference, but in reality, what we have similar with our all, all the rest of creation is that we were created. That's all it is, right? What makes us different from the animals? What makes us different from the trees? From the sun, the moon? They're all different creations, but we're all creations. We are a creation of His hands. What about the angels? They're also a creation of the Lord. So, how can a creation elevate itself as if it did something on its own? 
So humanity itself should not look at itself as something that is special of its own. No. What the Lord did that separated us, that set us apart from the rest of His entire creation, is that He created us according to His image and likeness. According to His image and likeness. Now, did we deserve to be created according to His image and likeness? We did not. Not at all. We haven't done anything. It was the beginning of our creation. So He created us according to His image and likeness. I like us to take an example of a very poor man. This poor man lived in poverty his whole life, has a very rich uncle. And this uncle passes away. And by whatever situation next of kin, this poor man inherits all of his riches. Can this man boast and say that it is the work of my hands that I am rich? Of course not. He did nothing, he didn't lift a finger to gain any of the riches. Right? It was given to him by mere chance. A mere relationship. In a similar manner, we need to keep in mind that all that we have, all the greatness that's in us, as the Lord said, we are the crown, we are the crown of His creation. It has nothing to do with our works, nothing to do with us. Think of someone who got a job through a you know a connection, or as they say, kosa, right? You got kosa or whatever how they say it in Arabic. You had a connection and you got this job. It wasn't your own, you didn't go to an interview, you couldn't, or you went to an interview, but you got it anyway. You wouldn't have really got it on your own. Does this person act very humble? Or does he act very boastful? What does he do? Does he walk around as if they were begging him to take the job? Of course not. They keep in mind that they did not actually deserve the job. They only got it because of a connection, so what do they do? They act humble. They realize that they're in a place that they don't deserve to be in, yet they're grateful that they're there. In the same, in like manner, we need to acknowledge who we as humans really are. In fact, we call God our Father, and He calls His children, but why? Why do we call Him Father? Why doesn't any other creature call Him Father? Do the angels call God Father? We call God our Father. Why? Not because He begot us, right? Because God only has one begotten Son, Jesus Christ. He didn't give birth to us. He created us, just like every other creation. Yet, out of His extreme love and mercy, right? As St. Paul says, we are like adopted. He says, I call you my children, sons and daughters, and you call me Father. So it is, again, none of the things that we have done on our own that makes us anything anything better or anything special that we have done. Nothing, no work of our hands has made us special. So truly to know that we are humble, to be humble is to know that we ourselves, all the good that is in us, or that was given us, is given to us by the grace of God. That is a truly humble Christian. In fact, when you think of it this way, even when you hear something like Oxios, say worthy. So we say, worthy St. Mary, worthy St. George, worthy uh, a new priest gets ordained, worthy Father, so-and-so. Why worthy? To what standard? Is anyone truly worthy of God? Never, right? Impossible. How can you be worthy of God? So what are we talking about when we say worthy? We're saying because none of us can truly live up or attain true worthiness in front of God, Basically, God lowers his standards in a way, right? Or makes us worthy, as we say in the church in a lot of prayers, the Lord make us worthy. And then we say worthy. So it's a certain standard that God allows us to attain. But we are not in true, in essence, of what we do can be worthy. We say in the lineage of the party, even if we are on earth a single day, we still would sin. So what makes us worthy? What makes us special? Whatever is special in us, whatever is good in us, is completely all together by the, on, with us due to the grace and mercy of God. This is true humility. Now, something important I want to share. We need to be aware of false humility. False humility. And this is something that maybe we go through when we're trying to be humble 
and we don't realize that we're we're being we're acting or living in a falsely humble manner. Now, we've all seen a lot of you know, it's a typical, especially in the Egyptian culture. We say a lot of I'm the lowest, and we say all these words and words and words and words, and it's like you feel like this person. Is at the bottom of everything. I don't deserve, and all these nice words, right? And then at the end, what happens? The person says all these things and you first, and very humble, right? You say, very humble person. Then something happens, an argument. And all of a sudden, the same person says, Do you know who I am? Or do you know who you're talking to? How can you speak to me this way? And all of a sudden, look at what, what happened. Weren't you just like the, the bottom of the list you said, or the last person? What happened? Very confusing, right? True humility, true humility is not attained by doing acts of humility. We cannot do a few acts of humility and think that we are becoming humble. Not at all. Humility is a perspective. It's an understanding. It is a spirit. It is a life. It is the way we view ourselves truly in light of Christ. And this, I think, is probably the biggest thing I want to highlight, when we want to attain humility, let us not think we can attain it by performing acts of humility. Rather, it is an understanding, a life, a perspective, an acknowledgement of who we really are in light of Christ. St. Anthony said, I saw the snares of the enemy spread out all over the world, and I said, groaning, who, what can get us through such snares? Then I heard a voice saying to me, humility. The fathers speak much about humility, the desert fathers, and the power of humility. Why is humility important? The fathers constantly say it is the door to all other virtues, it is the foundation. Because through humility, we, we receive power of God. Through humility, we can petition God and receive the power of God. So a person who is humble always acknowledges that of himself he can do nothing. Yet, through God, he can do all things. So when St. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that is a verse that is, a, a, that is coming out of a humble heart. Because he notices, I can't do anything on my own. Nothing. I'll tell you actually, most of the time, when we fall into sins, our biggest problem is we're not humble. We fall into them because we are not humble. A lot of our problems are because we're not humble. If we, some, a lot of us have sinned and fall into the same sin multiple times. And among the main reasons why we constantly fall into the same sin is because we think that we can get out of the sin by our own will, with our own strength, which is the biggest fallacy, the biggest problem is that we cannot overcome anything, right? We just said, if you live one day on earth, you'll still be sinful, you're still gonna commit sin. We cannot overcome any sin or any lust or any desire or any difficulty in our life by ourselves, impossible, not gonna happen. Yet, when we ourselves think that we can, we fall, why? Because we do not petition God, we do not ask God. The person who's truly humble acknowledges every sin and says, God, I cannot overcome it on my own. Please help me. Give me strength. That's why the Lord says, ask and you shall receive, knock and you shall find. He means it. Ask. Ask of me. You're just struggling to sin? Ask. Don't just try to overcome it on your own. Oftentimes, I agree, we need to do our part and do a few things and try to overcome it on our own, but we need to acknowledge no matter what we do on our own, will never be enough to live a righteous life. Uh, a monk once shared with me, saying that sometimes when we fall in sin, sometimes the feelings that we get is that we feel very guilty, or not just guilty, like very annoyed at ourselves, saying, how could I have fell into this sin again? How could I have fell into this sin? I shouldn't have fell into it again. As nice as that is, he shared with me something and he said, if you are away from God, why are you surprised? If you're away from God and you fall into a sin and you're upset that you fall into it, 
you're quiet, you're not humble. Because we acknowledge when we cut ourselves from God, we're susceptible to falling into sin. We should acknowledge that. When we don't, then we actually are deep down relying on ourselves that we can overcome sins without the work of the Holy Spirit. We see something else that comes out of a true life of humility. A person who's humble, like we said, acknowledges, can do nothing of himself without God, and he needs God for all things. And all the good that is in him is from God. So the humble person will pray more, will read more, will fast, will take it seriously. Why? Because he acknowledges this is something that he needs to do. When we do not fast, deep down, part of it is lack of humility. We don't acknowledge that it's necessary for us. When we don't pray, we don't read, we don't come to church to communion, we are, in a sense, in a way, is a lack of humility. We feel that we are okay without it. Humility also leads to